Hey there, nation, and welcome to the show where we help you to play miniatures wargaming on a budget. It is I, Commander Chiefsgate, and we are back with another episode of Anarchy Road. This is a series that is dedicated to our Nicaragua Road Wars campaign, and in case of the music didn't give it away, my friend Dark Lord Mac is back in Battle Report number 91. It is a sabotage scenario that is fought between Iron Major as well as Dark Lord Mac. Iron Major will be bringing Thundrix Profiteers, his Venators, Squat Venators bounty hunter gang, and Dark Lord Mac will be the road crew of the pit slaves so in case you're tuning in for the very first time our road wars campaign is an unofficial homemade campaign rule setting that allows you to play a vehicle based campaign in the ash waste of necromunda it's a very much a mad max inspired type of game design where characters mount up on vehicles and they fight and so with that being said ladies and gentlemen we're gonna play some background music real quick as the music is playing we will show you photos of both gangs as well as our rosters if you want to see exactly what my friends are bringing for this scenario go ahead and pause and take a look at your own leisure so with that being said let's get this battle report on a roll Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, dying times here. So the scenario rules for this one is sabotage. The pit slaves will be the attackers in this battle report while the Venators are the defender. The target is that the Venators vehicle is targeting the scenario and sneak attack rules are in effect. The attacker gets his entire game but can't use vehicle while the defender gets five randomly chosen fighters and the rest are set up as reinforcements. Also the defender receives home turf advantage. Now for the deployment the defender can sit up anywhere on the battlefield but their vehicles must be deployed in the dead center of the battlefield and the attacker sits up within any two inches of any battlefield edge. And of course the attacker is free to use any table edge that they want to. Now the objective is to either hijack or destroy a single enemy vehicle component. Uh, attackers receive plus two to hit modifier for shooting, at, uh, shooting attacks while at the same time their close combat attacks automatically hit. And the attacking fighter who wounds a vehicle earns one point of experience for every wound they manage to inflict on the vehicle. Now, once this objective is achieved, the attacker must take flight, which means they achieve this objective by fleeing off of the battlefield by moving within one inch of any table field edge. Now, once the alarm is raised in this scenario, the defender gets D6 reinforcements at the beginning of every single end phase. Now, for the rewards on this one, the attacker receives D6 times 10 credits if they manage to destroy an enemy vehicle opponent or hijack a vehicle, while the defender earns D6 times 10 credit if the attacker fails. For experience, each fighter participating gets one point of experience point and the attack leader gets a bonus experience if they manage to achieve the objective. Now as for the reputation, you're one point of reputation fighting against each other for the very first time as well as plus the reputation for the attacker if they achieve their objective and if that happens the defender loses one point of reputation and if any gang bottles out they also lose a point of reputation as well. So with the scenario rules over, let's go and talk about battle plans as well as deployments. So here's an overhead shot of the entirety of the battlefield. As you can see, my friends are playing on a 4x4 table. My friend Iron Major, who is our resident terrain wizard, he's the guy who makes all the terrain on this channel. His forces are located right smack dab in the middle of the settlement, while Dark Lord Max's forces are deployed on the pretty much in the bottom uh, edge of the battlefield, as well as the right-hand side as well. Now, as for tactics on this one, unfortunately for Iron Major, he doesn't actually get a say about what he can do for the defense of his terrain. And the reason why that is the case is because he has to use random sentry rules, which means, of course, fighters are randomly picked they have a roll off to see who controls that fighter uh, either Dark Lord Mac or Iron Major so because that he doesn't have any real control of the defense of his of his uh, vehicle at the same time even when the alarm is raised when he gets reinforcements he gets a random number of fighters and it usually depends on who rolls off to see where those fighters deploy so because of that he does have his work cut out for him the Venators are fighting very much at a disadvantage on this one now as for Dark Lord Mac as you can see he has three fire teams located in the bottom left hand corner as well as the center half of the uh, table as well as on the right hand 
right side as well. His plan is to try to stealthily maneuver as quickly as he can towards the vehicle so that way he can get within close combat striking distance. And the reason why is because the Venator's vehicle, the Plunder, does have a very high toughness ca uh, t toughness characteristic, but his Pit Slaves have a really powerful close combat abilities with their Pit Slave tools. And so his plan is to assault the vehicle and destroy it that way in close combat so that way he can wreck the vehicle and then of course make it his escape. So with the scenario rules over with, as well as battle plans done with, let's go ahead and talk about deployment. So starting off with the road crew on the left hand side, up in the front is Crixus. He is a pit slave. He's got armor plates, shears, a rocket tassy special, as well as a skate artist skill. Right behind him is Sparkacus, the pit slave chief who's the leader of this gang. He's got armor plates as well as paired shears. He's also got a plasma gun. He's also got the commanding presence, escape artist, as well as overseer abilities. And right next on the right hand side is Ragnar the Hammer who is an ammo jack. He's got mesh armor, a combat shock with salve on shredder rounds, a power hammer, as well as the ammunition near skill. In the center of the plum area on the left hand side, that is Mayday, she's a techno, who's also got a last gun as well as the escape artist and fixer skill. Right next to her on the right hand side, that character's name is Doc Dealgood, he is a servidor. He's got armor plates as well as shears as a heavy stubber, he's also got the industrial machine and escape artist rule. And right next to the right hand side, that is Val the Impaler, that is a pit slave. He's got armor plates as well as a drop drill, he's also got a rocket tassy special and escape artist skill. And that pretty much makes a deployment here in the center. And finally, on the right-hand side, we have three more fighters. In the back, that fighter's name is uh, Ganicus. He is a pit fighter. He's got armor plates, twin shears, as well as rain of blows and escape artist skill. Right in front of him on the right-hand side, that character's name is Sulaco. He is a pit slave. He's got uh, armor plates, as well as a hammer. He's got a stub gun, dum-dum rounds, as well as escape artist uh, skill. And right next on the left-hand side, that is Nostromo, who is another pit slave. He's got armor plates, as well as a hammer for his tool. He's got uh, stub gun, dum-dum rounds, as well as the escape artist rule. And that pretty much makes up the deployment for the road crew. Meanwhile, for deployment for Thunderx Profiteers, in the center of the table we have the Plunder. It is a large hull type vehicle with a weapons cache with thunder sticks, boarding spikes, enclosed crew, as well as two locker and spare parts chests for the hull upgrades. It's got a kill switch on the engine, as well as a track for its drive with spare tracks and a turret mounted grabbing claw as well. And on the top of the vehicle, that character's name is Fagan. He is the dedicated driver for the uh, team. He's got a demolition driver skill as well as a jinx rule. Uh, he can't leave the vehicle because he's a dedicated driver. We just put that miniature there just so you know there's a fighter there. Now, right across Across him, of course, is Deadeye Lund, which is a hunter. He's got mesh armor, a plasma gun, a rocket tassy special, a fighting knife, as well as a specialist special rule. And right next on the right-hand side, that is Kazgan Drax Skewer. He is a hunt champion. He's got mesh armor, a jump booster with a man catcher, as well as a rocket tassy special. He's also got the fixer, as well as random blows skills. And on the left-hand side, we have the last two members of the uh, Thunderous Profiteers. On the bottom side, left-hand side, that is Galrod Allenson. He is a hunter. He's got mesh armor as well as a harpoon launcher and a rocket tassy special and a sword. He's also got the specialist uh, special rule. And right next on the right-hand side, that is Bjorgen Thunderick. He is a hunt leader. He's armed with mesh armor, a flamer, a rocket tassy special, and a fighting knife. He has the overseer ability as well as fast shot skill. And that pretty much makes a deployment for Thunderous Profiteers. So with deployment over with, we go directly to the top of turn number one, and my friends roll off for a priority seat which of them will be going first. So that takes us to the top of turn number one, and the Pit Slaves managed to get the initiative on this one. And on this round, real quick, I'm just going to tell you now, not much really happens, so because of that, I will be taking batch photos after several activations have taken place, so that way you get a good idea what ended up happening. So on the left-hand side, what ended up happening is that... Uh, uh, Crixus, as well as uh, Sparkacus, as well as Ragnar the Hammer. Those guys just basically move up as quick as they can, hugging along the building's left-hand side to stay out of sight. Meanwhile, in the center of the table, as you can see, the dedicated driver, Fagin, can't leave the vehicle, so he's still not on board. However, the rest of the fighters can very much kind of spread out, for the most part, around the vehicle, heading in different directions. It was a combination of different activations by different friends, but nobody has raised the alarm because nobody's in visual range of the squad bounty hunters. Meanwhile, for the most part, Mayday, as well as Doc Dealgood and Valley Impaler have just kind of held their ground. There's no reason for them to move at this point because they want to stay out of visual range. At the same time, they have a really good overwatch position from their location to open fire. And if you guys are noticing, you'll notice right next to them, these are cargo containers that Iron Major has actually made for this battle report. As you can see, they look absolutely fantastic. Uh, he actually wanted me to give a shout out to Jeremy of Black Magic Crafts. That's where he got the idea to build these cargo containers from. He basically just followed along with Jeremy's uh, or train tutorial on how to make these as well. And he built this because because we plan on doing a settlement uh, campaign using the new Book of the Outlaw, uh, Out Outcast uh, book that came out from Nicaragua, and so that's the reason why we have those there. And then finally, at the end of the turn, of course, we have uh, Ganicus as well as Sulaco Nostromo moving on as, as much as they can on the right hand side, using the cargo containers as cover so that way they can close a distance and engage the enemy. And that pretty much makes up turn number one for this one. 
So here's what I'm going to show the entirety of the battlefield at the end of turn number one, just to give you guys an overview of what's going on. As you can see, the assault fire teams on the left and right hand flank of the pit slaves are slowly creeping their way towards the center of the battlefield, while his third fire team in the center on the bottom there just kind of remains in overwatch position. Meanwhile, Iron Major's forces just kind of scattered about because of the sentry special rules, and that pretty much makes up turn number one. So with turn number one over with, we go directly to the top of turn number two, and once again, my friends roll off our priority to see which of them will be going first. So with that, we go directly to the top of turn number two, and the Pit Slaves managed to get the initiative on this one, so Dark Lord Mac will be going first. And just like in the previous turn, not much really happened in this turn because of all the different sentry rules that was happening and the alarm was not raised. So because that, we're going to kind of go through this pretty quickly and kind of show you some group activations after several guys have been activated. So once again, Sparkakiss as well as uh, Crixus and Ragnar the Hammer, they move up closer to the uh, Plunder using that building as cover to stay out of visual sight. And once again, Iron Major's forces are pretty much scattered about the entirety of the center of the battlefield just because they have that random sentry rules going on. And as you can see, they pretty much still have a pretty cohesive perimeter uh, surrounding that vehicle. Once again, Dark Lord Mac has kept his uh, third Overwatch uh, uh, fire team with Mayday as well as Doc Dealgood and Valley Impaler back. They didn't move from their spots because he has no intention of moving them at this point. And finally, here's a close-up of Sulaco, Nostromo, as well as Ganicus, slowly making their way up the right-hand side to kind of flank from the right. And once again, that pretty much makes up turn number two for this one. So here's an overview shot of the entirety of the battlefield at the end of turn number two. As you can see, not much is going on. Once again, the pit slaves are slowly creeping their way directly towards the plunderer, so that way they can assault it. They're also staying out of visual range and using cover, so that way they don't raise the alarm, uh, because the Venators uh, for the Undercriminal here are very much a shooting-heavy uh, gang, while his pit slaves are very much close combat oriented for Dark Lord Mac. So with turn number two over with, we go directly to the top of turn number three, and once again, my friends roll off for priority to see which of them will be going first. So that takes directly to the top of turn number three for the Pit Slaves, and for Dark Lord Mac's very first activation, he then activates Sulaco. Sulaco does a double move over the right hand side behind that shanty, so that way he can take cover and get closer to the plunderer at the same time. Meanwhile, Thundric makes his way back directly towards Gorgon Thundric makes his way back directly towards the plunder. And same thing with Galrod Allenson as well, uh, just because of the random sentry rules and Fagan, the dedicated driver, is still on board the vehicle. And this is when Dark Lord Mac decides to make his move. He decides to activate Mayday, who's a techno who does a group activation with Doc Dealgood. Mayday stays in her position so that way she can shoot later. So for the first person to go up first is Doc Dealgood. Doc Dealgood does a simple action to move forward so that way he's in position to open fire with his heavy stubber. And because of his industrial machine special rule, he can move and shoot his heavy stubber as well. And he opens fire with the heavy stubby directly into Galrod Allison, who's right across from him. Doc Dealgood opens up with this heavy stubborn actually rolls a 3 on the rapid fire dice on this one. He actually managed to put a serious injury directly on a Fagan, so because that Fagan is now currently laying on the decking of the plunder and he's currently bleeding out, a real bad situation. He does manage to hit Galrod Allison, however, but he fails to wound him, but he does manage to pin him, which is actually kind of interesting as well. And because the Heavy Stubber is such a loud weapon, the alarm is raised, and so now, just like that, Iron Major can now operate the rest of his gang like he could like a normal game of Necromunda. However, Mayday still gets to go next, so because that she takes a basic action to aim with her last gun and another basic action to open fire with it, so that way she gets a plus one to hit. Unfortunately for uh, Mayday, she did roll an roll for her rapid fire dice, so because that she does currently go out of ammo. However, though, it's not such a big deal, and the reason why is because they do have an ammo jack within the road crew, which means they get normal ammo rolls because of that hanger on. So her last gun does manage to hit Bjorgen and Thundrick, however, though, fails to wound him, so because of that, uh, Bjorgen Thundrick is currently pinned. So for Iron Major's next activation, he activates Deadeye Lund, his hunter. His hunter does a basic action aim with his plasma gun, another basic action open fire it, firing rapid fire directly towards Doc Dealgood. Unfortunately though, he missed his shots so because of that, not much really happened from there. Dark Lord Mac then activates Ness. He does a group activation with Sparkakiss as well as Crixus and uh, Ragnar the Hammer. Uh, basically, those guys move up quickly as they can. I believe it was Crixus actually does a double move forward, while Sparkakiss as well as uh, Ragnar the Hammer move up normally, so that way they can open fire with their plasma gun as well as their combat shotgun, respectively. So Bjorgen Thundrick opens up, uh, sorry, not Bjorgen Thundrick, Ragnar the Hammer opens up with his combat shock and firing salvo rounds directly into Garrod Allison. Managed to put that guy out of action as well by putting an out cold reaction onto him as well. So even though he no longer participates in the battle report though, he will actually make a full recovery. Meanwhile, Iron Major then happens to fire up a spark of kiss. He actually does a supercharged shot with his plasma gun, firing it directly into the uh, into the plunderer, aiming for the tracks. But unfortunately for though, he misses his shot. He rolls a one because that nothing much really happens from that shot. 
So Iron Major Gundam goes next and then activates his leader Bjorgen Thunderick. He does a simple action to get back on his feet again and another simple action to open fire with his flamer, aiming it directly at Crixus and catching him in a sheet of uh, ignited Prometheum. He does fail to wound the Pit Slave, however though, the Pit Slave does fail his blaze test because I think he runs like 10 or 9, in, nine or 10 inches directly to the south and he's currently on fire and he's currently pinned as well. So that part's kind of rough for uh, Dark Lord Mac. So for Dark Lord Max, next activation then sends up Val the Impaler, who does a double move forward directly behind that Hesco Barrier. He's doing that for a couple reasons. One, he's using the Hesco Barrier to protect himself, and he's also moving closer to the Plunder, so that way he can attack. At the same time, Dark Lord Max said he moved him there, so that way he can lend some assistance to Crixus to put out the flames uh, in the next turn. Iron Major then activates Kazgan Draxkewer, who does a charging attack directly into Sulaco, and with that jump boost that he has, he's able to close the distance very quickly. So because that, he does attack Sulaco to his right-hand flank. Now, Kazgan Draxler does manage to hit as well as wound Sulaco. Unfortunately, though, for the injury dice, they rolled a serious injury. So Sulaco falls face first directly into the ground and is currently bleeding out, which is a bad spot for him to be in because in the next turn, uh, Iron Major can just take him out with a Cru de Gras. However, not to be outdone, our Dark Lord Mac then goes next. He activates Ganicus's Pit Fighter as a group activation with Nostromo. Uh, Ganicus actually lands a long distance charge going at the full. Uh, Full maximum amount of seven inches directly into uh, Kazgan Draxir and gauges him in close combat. Unfortunately for Dark Lord Mac, Dostrobo does fail his uh, charge action. He just falls just two inches short of actually reaching Kazgan. But because of that, Ganicus as well as the uh, Hunt Champion going directly into close combat. And surprisingly, Ganicus managed to put a serious injury directly onto Kazgan Draxkewer. Now I say surprisingly because what is up happening, he actually gets three attacks base, he has a paired attack which gives him four attacks, he has twin shears, and since he charged four, he gets actually five attacks directly on the Kazgan. He actually managed to hit him three times and wound him three times, and because the shears cost three damage apiece, he actually rolls 12 injury dice for Kazgan. He rolled a bunch of serious injuries, one flesh wound, and that was it. So because that Kazgan got really lucky on that one, falls face down to the ground, he's currently bleeding out, and he can still recover. However, though, if he doesn't get out of this uh, serious injury, though, he can be taken out of the Coup de Gras in the next turn. So because of that, we go directly to the end phase, and once again, two more reinforcements actually show up on the right-hand side. Dark, uh, my buddy Iron Major managed to get the uh, the roll-off on that one. So coming out on the battlefield, we have two fighters. We have Ivar Crazy Eyes, who's a hunt champion. He's armed with mesh armor as well as a plasma gun. He's got a rocket tansy special, a fighting knife, as well as a fast shot ability. And at the same time, Enric Iron Hell also shows up too. He's a hunter with mesh armor, a rocket tansy special, a fighting knife, as well as a combat shotgun. And so with that, we then go to the recovery phase for the end phase. Fagin is still seriously injured, so he is currently laying on the top of the vehicle, uh, just kind of laying there and bleeding out in the decking for the most part. As for Sulaco, Sulaco actually rolls a flesh wound, so because he does flip over, he is one toughness weaker though because of the uh, flesh wound, but he can still fight, still shoot, and the same thing happens with Kazgan Drax Shiver. So because he does get a flesh wound as well, so he rolls over, but now he's only toughness two, which makes him much more easier to wound. So with the end phase over with, we go directly to the top of the turn number three. So here's an overhead shot of the entirety of the uh, table at the end of turn number three. As you can see, the pit slaves are slowly making their way forward. They're assaulting on the left-hand side. The right-hand assault team, though, is being blunted right now by Kazgan, Drexkewer, as well as the reinforcements are showing up. At the same time, the overwatching elements are still suppressing from the center, and at the same time, looks like he's trying to shore up his defenses to move up forward as well. So with the end of turn number three, we go directly to the top of turn number four, and Dark Lord Mac and Iron Major roll off for initiative to see which of them will be going first. So with that, we go directly to the top of turn number four, and once again, the Pit Slaves manage to get the initiative on this one. So for his very first activation, Dark Lord Mac does not waste any time. He does a group activation with Ganicus as well as Nostromo, and both those guys land successful charges directly against their enemies across from them. Uh, what ends up happening is that um, uh, Ganicus goes directly into Einrich Ironhell to catch him in close combat, and Nostromo goes directly into Ivar Crazy Eyes. And so because of that, they both do launch their attacks forward. Needless to say, Ganicus had no problem whatsoever putting the hurt directly onto Enric Ironhell. Managed to put a grievous injury on him, so because he does survive, but he'll miss out his next battle report because of his recovery. At the same time, Nostrom had no problem whatsoever putting a serious injury directly onto um, and, uh, Ivar Crazy Eyes. He is currently laying on the ground, and he is currently bleeding out as well, which is a really bad spot for him to be in because he'd be taken out with a coup de gras. So with that, we go directly back to Iron Major, and Iron Major once again activates Bjorgen Thundrick. So Bjorgen Thundrick actually does a couple of things. He uses fast shot ability to open his flamer twice directly into the Pit Slaves. Magic Catch, uh, both uh, Ragnar the Hammer as well as Spartacus, and a sheet of Promethean Flame. 
He does manage to put a serious injury onto Ragnar the Hammer, so Ragnar the Hammer crashes face first into the ground. He is currently bleeding out, which is a really bad spot for him to be at because he could be taken out with a coup de gras. And Spartacus does lose a wound, and he actually fails his blaze test because he goes running back, I think, nine inches to the left hand side. And he is currently pinned, and he is also currently on fire. And because Bjorgen Thundrick does have the fast shot ability, all of his shooting attacks only count as one simple action. He then turns to the left hand side to open fire with his flamer once again, catching both Crixus as well as Valley Impaler in a sheet of Promethean fire. Unfortunately for Iron Major though, he doesn't do anything against Crixus, so Crixus is still pinned, he is still on fire, and for Valiant Paler, he does fail to wound that guy as well, but Valiant Paler does fail his blaze test because he does running up forward, I think, seven inch, uh, four or five inches forward, and he is currently pinned, and he's also on fire. So for Dark Lord Max activation, he then activates Doc Dealgood. Doc Dealgood does a basic action aim, so get plus one to hit with his uh, heavy stubber, and he also does another basic action, opening a fire directly into Bjorndrian Thundrick. And he does manage to hit Bjorgen Thundrick three times, rolling three on the rapid fire dice. He hits him three times, but he fails to wound him all three times. So because that Bjorgen Thundrick once again is currently pinned, he is laying on the ground, just basically got the wind knocked out of him at this point. Iron Major then once again activates uh, Dead Eye Lund once again, takes a basic action to aim with his plasma gun and another basic action to open fire with it directly into Doc Dealgood. And as you can see in this photo, not only does he manage to hit Doc Dealgood, but he also manages to wound him three times. So because of that, uh, Doc Dealgood does go crashing into the ground with a out-of-action result being rolled up for him. He actually receives a grievous injury, so just like that, Doc Dealgood does go into recovery, and he will miss out in his next battle report. So with that, Dark Lord Mac goes next. He then activates Sulaco. Sulaco does a simple action to get back on his feet again, uh, because it takes a little bit to get him up on his great feet. And then he does another basic action to attack with his hand weapon in close combat with his hammer, and he is directly at Kazgan Draxkewer. He does manage to hit and wound Kazgan Draxkewer, but once again rolls a serious injury on him, which is a precarious spot for him to be in because uh, all attacks are coup de gras, and Kazgan Draxkewer will go out of action. So for the rest of the turn is dedicated to the Pit Slaves. Uh, once again, uh, this one's actually taking place after several activation Crixus, as well as uh, Valley Pelly do try to put their flames out with simple actions, but unfortunately for them though, they both fell those actions, so because of that, they are still currently on fire. And once again, Mayday does another simple action to reload her last gun, which is no problem because it got an ammo roll of two up. She does try to fire another shot, but unfortunately for her though, she rolls a one for the shot and she misses. And once again, over here on the top, uh, Sparkus does a simple action to put out the flames on his body, which he does manage to pass, and another simple action to get back on his feet again, and that takes up all of his activations. So the action phase over with, we go directly to the end phase. And during the end phase, unfortunately for Iron Major, he does have to take a bottle test. As you can see in this photo, he does fail that bottle test, so because of that, he will need to roll cool results for all of his fighters to see if they stay on the table. And at the same time, he also loses one point of reputation, which is kind of sad. In the recovery phase, Ragnar the Hammer is still seriously injured, so he is still laying on the ground and he is bleeding out, open for anyone who wants to attack him. Fagin, the dedicated driver, however, does make a flesh wound, so because he does roll over, he's currently pinned with one flesh wound on him, which drops his toughness characteristic by one. And once again, over here on the left-hand side of the battlefield, uh, Ivar Crazy Eyes is currently uh, uh, seriously injured as well, so he is still laying on the ground and still bleeding out. And finally, Kaz Gandrax does finally succumb to his wounds, rolling at 44 on the series injury table. So he does get a grievous injury, which means he'll make a full recovery eventually. But until then, though, he does go to recovery and he will miss out his next battle report. At this point of the game, then my buddy Iron Major decides to call it because he doesn't want to take any more chances than he already has. And just like that, the Pit Slaves managed to pull a victory out on this sabotage scenario against the Venators. So that being said, ladies and gentlemen, we go directly to the post game because this battle report is now officially over. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over. All right, so now it's time for the post game. First of all, we talk about Thundrix Profiteers. For injuries, he actually suffered three out of action injuries on this one. Kaz Gandrax, Skewer, and Eric Einhell both suffer grievous injuries, so they both go into recovery, which means they'll miss out on the next scenario. And Galron Allison, however, makes a full recovery with an out cold result. Now, currently, none of the members of his gang did advance during this time period, and from his wasteland territories, he earned one point of reputation and managed to scrounge up some unit animals which they hunted and they avoided starvation. At the same time, also scavenged 17 credits with the materials. At the trading post, they earned 17 credits from their stash, and because of their dire straits and their really bad situation, 
Iron Major decides he's going to make another alliance, this time making an alliance with the noble house of Ulanti because they can generate credits for him and they also have some pretty good fighters as well. At the same time, the remaining members of the gang decide to work on the hull of the plunderer and once again they do manage to repair it back to its full health of 8 wounds. Now for the reputation, they earn one point of reputation from their territories as well as one reputation for fighting against the pit slaves for the very first time. However, since he did bottle out though, he did lose one point of reputation which brings his grand total to 9. His new record now is at 1 win as well as 4 losses and his new gang rate now is at 2,635 points. So up next are the road crew, which are the winners of the scenario for injuries. Uh, Dark Lamac does suffer one injury with Doc Dealcode, who suffered a grievous injury, so because he does go to recovery, and he will miss out on his next battle. However, no members of this game did advance at this time. Now from his territories, from his wasteland territory, he actually got one part of reputation, and he found a mineral outcropping, which allowed his gang to actually scrounge up 37 credits in total. From his street urchin's territory, he earns 28 credits and 110 credits from the workshop, and another 40 credits from a Holstead, which the brand new territory is able to capture during this time period from one in the scenario. Now, from the training post, he ended up scarring 217 credits in total when combined with his stash as well as the credits from his territory. He actually uh, spent 40 credits to avoid starvation, so that way his whole gang is fed. He then recruited two Rodox with his money, named Victor as well as Singed. Both those guys cost 50 credits apiece, so that way he can do medical escort missions uh, without a problem for his gang. And he took the remaining 70 any credits and he put it right back into his stash. And at the same time, because he realizes everybody's making alliances at the same time, Time, Dark Lord Mac decides to make an alliance with the Guild of Coins so that way he can generate more income for his gangs and that way he can build up quicker. Now for his reputation, he earned one point of reputation from his territory as well as one from fighting against the Venators for the very first time which brings his grand total of 16 points reputation. His current record now is at 3 wins and 3 losses and his new rating now is at 2,434 points. So that's going to do it for this one you guys. As always, please feel free to like, comment, and or subscribe. Your guys' input is invaluable to us as always. Also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, as well as blogger.com for all the latest, greatest hobby news related to this channel. That's good to do for this one, you guys. I'll catch you guys next one. Peace out and stay classy.